Hello, everyone, and welcome to another puzzle solving video uh, in which we attempt a run at chess.com's Puzzle Rush Survival, going from zero all the way up to 60 and potentially even higher. Now, most of you have probably heard of Puzzle Rush Survival. It's an excellent tool for tactical improvement, whether you are a beginner or a master or even a grandmaster. Um, now, in, in Puzzle Rush Survival, you get a series of exercises of ascending difficulty. Um, starting very, very basic, uh, and gradually, step by step, the puzzles get more and more advanced until you hit uh, master and even grandmaster level exercises. Um, you also get three strikes, so you get a little bit of leeway. When you make that third mistake, the run ends, and your point total uh, is just the number of exercises that you've solved correctly. So it's a very versatile tool. Whether you're a beginner or a master, uh, you benefit from doing regular Puzzle Rush survival runs. Um, I do several every week, just kind of, you know, non-negotiably because it helps me stay uh, in good tactical form. So I've done one of these videos in the past, a couple of years ago, it was pretty well received. I figure uh, I'll do another one. Um, just as with all of my puzzle solving videos, my emphasis is going to be on kind of very carefully walking you all through uh, my process of solving both very easy as well as advanced exercises. I'm going to let you in on how I approach these exercises, what I see, um, all of my calculations, and just in general, uh, I'll try to give you as much of an insight as I can into the, my process of solving tactical exercises. And whenever possible, I will try to translate that uh, into practical tips for seeing these types of tactics over the board. Now, as the puzzles get more advanced, uh, obviously the calculation involved gets deeper and more convoluted. So my recommendation, if particularly if you're a, a newer player, is to have a physical board handy uh, so that you can set up uh, the positions when they get more advanced and follow along because I will mostly try to rely on arrows uh, in order to give more advanced players a chance to practice their visualization. Now, when we get to the really advanced puzzles, um, if I deem fit, I will set some of them up on chess base. And in that case, I will move the pieces around. So if, if the solution gets too convoluted, uh, then I will move the pieces around. But once again, um, have a chessboard handy. Hopefully you have a chessboard. If not, you should definitely get one um, and buckle in. I hope that uh, you'll be able to extract some value from this video, whether you're you know, a total beginner or, uh, or a master. Okay, let's jump in. Let's get started. Um, now, this is a pretty raw video. I'm not going to edit out my mistakes. If I get three strikes before number 60, so be it. Um, I'm also recording in the morning for the first time in my life. It's actually 11 a.m. rather than 11 p.m., which is my preferred recording time. So cut me a little bit of slack. And uh, finally, I do apologize. Slight, uh, slightly inferior audio today. I'm using a, a secondary mic, um, but hopefully it is it is bearable. Let's get started. Let's do a survival run. Here we go. Now, the first batch of exercises, very roughly 15 to 20, are going to be super rudimentary. Um, so 99% of these exercises are going to go under the umbrella of like one of several themes. There's going to be basic checkmates, right? Made in one, made in two. Sometimes you're going to get made in three. Um, and these checkmates generally exploit you know, a couple of very fundamental tactical concepts. And you get the back rank mate, uh, which very frequently features in chess.com tactics in general. Uh, you get mates that involve like a bishop queen battery, like the one that we're staring at here. Uh, and you're also going to get uh, basic tactical motifs like a fork or maybe capturing a, a hanging piece. So for the first set of exercises, you should be looking for something very simple. Uh, if you're going down a rabbit hole of variations, that probably means you're missing something pretty easy. Now, in this exercise, I'm immediately drawn to the queen bishop battery. Um, that is a term which we use to describe a bishop and a queen that are, that are on the same diagonal and that kind of serve as a bazooka. That queen can infiltrate uh, the opponent's territory, safe in the knowledge that there is a nice little bishop all the way back uh, that is supporting the queen's aggressive endeavors. Here we have the classic checkmate on h7. Notice the bishop on b1 and the queen on d3 forming that battery and allowing us to deliver mate. Okay, here we have the black pieces. I immediately notice that we have a bunch of pieces that kind of surround white's king. Once again, uh, notice the role of the bishop 
this is not a battery, but the bishop is protecting the knight on h3, um, which makes the white king even more confined. This is a simple mate in two moves. Uh, our queen can slide up to f2, forcing the king back to h1, and uh, queen g1 there would have been checkmate. The puzzle stops there. Now, if you're a newer player and you're watching this and you're like, well, wait, how, how did you see that move? The best way of developing your tactical rudiments is just to do as many of these exercises as possible. If you do, you know, oh, 50,000 of these basic exercises, you're just going to start seeing, you know, these basic mates. At first, it might be a laborious process of going down the checklist. Okay, is it a back rank mate? Is there a battery? Is there a hanging piece? But eventually, uh, just like with any skill like that, it, it translates from system two to system one. Um, it starts being very instinctive rather than being kind of an effortful process. Um, and you will get those rudiments down, um, just like learning your multiplication tables or learning how to ride a bike. At first, you, you don't think it's going to be possible. But once you practice enough, you just find that you naturally start to spot these things really quickly. So here um, we have a classic back rank mate. Uh, these three pawns uh, are a dead giveaway. So we deliver the mate on d1, take the rook. It's checkmate. Here again, we're going to get our fair share of back rank mates in the first 20 exercises. We're down a million pieces. It doesn't matter. All I care about is, again, these three pawns. Check on a1, take on c1. Okay, puzzle number five. All right, so once again, we have a battery. Um, queen bishop battery is not the only type of battery. Um, doubled rooks, a rook and a queen on the same file, all of that goes under that umbrella. Um, and one thing that you have to learn how to do very smoothly is count attackers and defenders, right? So we have the rook on d8, queen on d7. White has just positioned a rook on d1. It's only defended by the king. That's really bad news for right. We can just take that rook. It's checkmate. Okay, next position, again, is a checkmate in one move. I'm noticing this pawn on g7. Uh, it's being attacked by the queen and by the rook, and it's only protected by the king, which means that queen takes g7 is mate. Okay, here we have another mate in one, bishop on b6, queen on f6. What are they both staring at? Well, they're both staring at the f2 pawn. What do we capture it with? Well, we obviously capture it with a queen. That limits the king's escape squares and results in checkmate. This uh, is another rudimentary pattern. Um, now, it's important not to be waylaid and fooled by uh, the potential fork on e5. We have bigger fish to fry. Um, this is a, actually a very important uh, mating construction. When you have this knight on g4 and the queen on h3. Now, remember, when I say these things, I'm also implying that the same goes for white, right? So if white, for instance, has a queen on a6 and a knight on b5, chess is a symmetrical game in that way. Um, there are a lot of checkmates that stem from this collaboration between the queen and the knight. And the simplest one is the check on h2, followed by the mate on f2. You see this uh, constantly. Okay. Next puzzle, another mate in one. We have the bishop. We have the queen. Yet again, they're both looking at the g7 pawn. It's undefended. We, ca we capture it. Tenth puzzle. Now, this is a slightly different mating motif. I see the rook on g8, which is cutting off the white king. Anytime you have the king on the side of the board like that and it's surrounded by heavy pieces, uh, you should be thinking ladder mate. And that's where one rook or queen holds a file and the other rook or queen delivers the checkmate. Here the ladder mate is delivered by rook h5 and then rook takes h4. Again, the bishop kind of in a defensive role uh, in this first set of exercises. Okay, 10 down, 50 to go. This is yet another checkmate in one move. Now, for these basic puzzles, I'm not even really counting the material. I'm not going through the full process of observation making that you're going to see me do when the puzzles get more advanced because I kind of already know that this is either going to be checkmate in one or two moves or there's going to be some very basic tactics. So I'm almost kind of cheating. I'm taking a shortcut. But yet again, knight f7, that's mate because the white rook is controlling the e7 square. Queen to e6, another mate in one move. King on c8, right? One basic piece of advice that you often get when you castle queenside the safest square for the king is often b8 or b1 and one of the reasons why is this a2 or a7 pawn often becomes weak uh, in middle game situations but another big reason is uh, epitomized in this exercise queen a8 is just checkmate um black would really kill to have that king on b8 okay on we go yet again we're down a million pieces but i don't care all that I'm paying attention to is the queen and the rook. Um, these pieces can combine to deliver a simple mate. We start with the lateral check on h6. 
okay, white blocks with queen h3, but of course the main point is that if white plays king to g1, then you have the mate on h2. And again, for, for newer players watching this, um, not only should you not you know, worry that uh, how, how am I solving this so fast, you're going to get there, but also just try to kind of pay attention to the various mating patterns that you see, right? And maybe note them down in a notebook if you want to be really diligent. Like this is a mate with heavy pieces on the second rank. We've encountered a mate using a queen bishop battery. We've encountered a ladder mate, right? So when you accumulate that knowledge, that also helps to kind of tune your pattern recognition. Let's take that queen. Let's move on. Okay, this one we can do really quickly. It's just a repetition of a lot of the exercises we've gotten. And for the first time, we actually have an exercise where the objective is not to deliver mate. Um, here, the white king is clearly a lot safer than it's been in the previous exercises. And so we now kind of get into that area where we have to start making slightly more involved observations. We might get slightly more, uh, slightly longer variations, but still you're looking for pretty basic stuff. Now, uh, the tactical abbreviation that I share in every one of my puzzle solving videos is LPDO. Uh, I think this was coined by the British Grandmaster John Nunn, uh, who's written a ton of excellent books, but, but don't quote me on that. It stands for loose pieces drop off. In general, undefended pieces, a piece that's not protected by any pawns or other pieces, super important component of really the majority of tactics that do not ultimately result in checkmate. So here, looking around the board, we see that the rook on h3 is completely undefended, and the white king is exposed, and the black queen is active. Those are the preconditions for a fork or a double attack, but obviously you can't give the check on f1 here. You need to deflect the white king by trading the rooks. Now we deliver the check on f1. We take the rook, and we're up a bishop. Okay, now we get back to basic checkmates. Again, we have the doubled rooks on the g-file, as well as the queen on h3. Again, Important to count defenders and attackers very smoothly. The knight on g2 is only guarded twice, which means we can safely take it with the rook, and it's made on the next move. Now, this is uh, another pretty simple mating pattern. This one's actually really, really important um, because it doesn't look like there's anything resembling checkmate. The black king is tucked away in the corner, but the key observation is this pawn on g6. Anytime you have a pawn on g6 like that, you should essentially be thinking in terms of back rank mate. So in order for back rank mate to be delivered, we have to get rid of the black rook. We have just the way to do that. Now, technically, this isn't actually mate. Black can block with the bishop and block with the queen, but as a result, we're going to be up uh, a full knight. Rook a8, bishop d8, bang, bang, and we're winning the game. Quick digression, okay? Um, and I know that if you're a you know, more advanced player, this might be a little bit tedious for you. You're, you're welcome to fast forward, but still, I, I, I'm a firm believer in the fact that constantly repeating your rudiments and your basics, that uh, keeps you grounded. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. There's definitely no harm in, in doing that. Um, now, you might be thinking, okay, these are cool tactical motifs. Do they actually happen in, in real games? And the answer is yes, they do. So just off the top of my head, the puzzle that we just solved, right, with that queen sacrifice, take a look at this game that I played in uh, 2006. I'm going to switch scenes here to chess space. Just give me one moment. Load up the game. Here we go. Okay. And uh, Let's actually add the player names. Oh, just a moment here. A little bit of technical manipulation. Okay, now this is my game from the Pan American Championships in 2006. Uh, I was rated 2000. Okay, just one more moment. I'm going to see if I can those player names up. It was working perfectly just a second ago, but just when I need it to be working. It's giving me a white screen. Let's see, what is this? Okay, Clyde, you're going to edit this out. Or Clyde's going to leave this in. We'll see. I'll, uh, I'll leave it up to Clyde. There we go. I finally was able to... Finally was able to get the players... Uh, I promise you this is not worth it. This was not worth the struggle, but we finally get the player names up. Um, you can see that this is my game against Joel Guerrero. Now, white is up a knight in this position. And you might be wondering, well, what does this have to do with the previous puzzle? Well, there are many ways to win this game and convert the advantage, but I found a really flashy and very efficient way to do it. I started by playing the move f6. f6, 
Uh, the point being to establish this thorn in black side. My opponent responded with g5, and now precisely the same motif. You eliminate the rook, and in doing so, you also deflect the black king onto uh, the worst possible square, where it's dominated by this pawn on f6. Rook d8 is going to be checkmate, and so my opponent uh, resigned the game after queen takes f8. Just a quick uh, public service announcement that yes, you know these tactics are actually very common, and you do improve in a very specific way uh, by solving them and repeating them again and again. Let's go back to uh, our survival here. In the next position, uh, we have kind of a confusing situation. Now, immediately, I'm noticing that the white queen is hanging, but I'm also seeing that the rook on c2 is attacked twice and only defended once. So all we need to do is get this queen out with tempo, and uh, everything will be copacetic. There's just the way to do that. Check, trade, and just pick up the extra rook. Okay, next we have another fairly rudimentary exercise. This is just checkmate in two moves. Um, you should not be fooled by the lack of queens on the board in general. A checkmate is possible with the most meager of uh, material, right? A rook, a king, and a pawn is more than enough to set up a mating net. We start with a check on b8, and here you should spot that rook f8 is checkmate because, well, our pawn is going forward and our pawn is defending the rook. Okay, number 20. Okay, so here we have a very sharp tactical situation. I'm seeing immediately that there's again the situation with the black king on f8, kind of similar uh, to the earlier exercise where, we, remember, we delivered that mate on a8. So I'm immediately seeing that there is this very tempting check on h8 that forces the black king to move onto e7. But I also see that we have these doubled rooks on the e-file, and in that situation, we could capture the knight with a discovered check against the black king, then the rook on e8 is going to fall as well. That looks very promising. Now, you might wonder why e takes d5 is not correct. And e takes d5, white might actually be better there, but it's a pretty open-ended move. It gives black a lot of different options. Black can maybe trade rooks and then intercept white's queen. And it's also important at this point, once you reach puzzle number 20, number 25, to really start counting the material because it's not enough to go up a piece here because black has a 1,000 pawns on the queen side, so it's actually going to be very double-edged. You need to do more than that. E takes d5 check, and simply rook takes rook with overwhelming material advantage. Number 21. Okay, so this is a very famous and very important tactical motif called the Greek gift sacrifice. Um, for a lot of you, looking at this position will set alarm bells ringing. The lights will be flashing red. Um, for those who might not recognize the tactic immediately, again, this is how you learn. I remember as a 1400, um, I missed a Greek gift sacrifice. I had never seen it before. My coach hadn't taught me uh, that motif. And it was just like, I was blind, but now I see. You know, once you understand this mechanism, you will look for it everywhere. Um, and in more advanced cases, the Greek gift can actually be kind of an ambiguous sacrifice. This is a very clean example of the Greek gift. It starts by sacking the bishop on h7. Uh, you're luring the king out into the open. Now, step two is the knight check on g5. And step three, if the black king would have stepped back to g8, would have been uh, to play queen h5 with devastating threats against black's king. And I don't want to digress too far and talk too much about the Greek gift. That's a whole separate tactical motif. Uh, in the puzzle, they uh, give us the queen immediately. Okay, here we have force checkmate. Another important uh, mating pattern. We have the queen, we have the knight. And in a previous puzzle, we were able to mate with queen h7, queen f7. Here, there is a knight on f6, so we need the services of uh, our bishop. We need to go bishop h7 in order to get rid of the knight. Uh, king h8, knight takes f7 is just checkmate. Now, we deliver the familiar mate. Okay, number 23. A slightly strange position. Material seems to be about equal. And immediately, first thing I notice is that the king and the queen are unforkable squares. And we have a knight that can deliver that fork on c2. So is the move knight takes c2? Well, no, there is a rook on c1. But right now you see that there's a queen on g5. And the puzzle pieces fit together perfectly. I love that moment, that aha moment when you make observations, you notice one thing, you notice another thing, and then boom, everything clicks beautifully and you solve, right? You sack the queen. Then we take on c2 and cleanly pick up white's queen with an, a full extra rook. Okay, number 24. Um, 
So here we have a, a situation where white has a huge development advantage. That's really the first thing that I notice is that we have essentially all of our pieces developed. Black has none, which tells me that if we are able to breach Black's king in any way, it's probably going to be devastating. We don't really need to calculate very far. And there is just the way to do that, right? So if you're a Vienna player, this should be pretty natural to you. If you look at the rook on f1 and the pawn on f4, if you can open up the f file, that is a direct avenue to the weakest square on the chessboard, which is the f7 pawn. But you need to get the move order right here because if you take the pawn on e5, <clears throat> you also have to notice that black is attacking our bishop. So black will grab the bishop and that seems pretty unconvincing. Is there a smarter way to do it? The answer is yes. We can start by sacking on f7. Now we play f takes e5. And you might be surprised that the puzzle ends there. I think a lot of you were like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a second. Why is that completely winning? <clears throat> Apologize. And actually, I do have the uh, possibility of pulling up the analysis board. So just really, really quickly, the reason that I didn't calculate past this point is just because you have to use your intuition. You've got like four pieces that are all in the attack. The Black King is completely exposed. This has to be winning. After King e8, we deliver another check on e6. Black is completely falling apart. And one nice illustration of that is Queen e7. We have another check on c8. And now a lovely tactic, deflection. Rook takes f8 and Queen takes Queen. Um, so the more tactically advanced you are, the more experienced you are, uh, the better tuned your intuition is going to be at quickly and accurately evaluating a position like this and saying, yes, I understand why this is completely winning. If you don't, this is a perfect opportunity to pause the video, set this position up on the chess.com analysis board, and play some moves with the engine, right? Analyze a little bit with the engine. Try to get a feel for why this position is so overwhelming. Um, in that way, you can really nuance your understanding of uh, sharp tactical positions. Uh, but in short, it's just because white is so ahead in development. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, 25. Here we go. All right. So now the puzzles gradually start to uh, kind of move from the very beginner rudimentary checkmate and tactical concepts to slightly more involved calculation. And here I noticed that we have a heavy piece endgame where white's king is uh, eminently checkable, shall we say. There's two checks that I notice. Well, queen f1 check just leads to an exchange of queens. Queen e1 check is a very promising move because after king h2, we leave room for the black rook to infiltrate f1, and we threaten checkmate on h1. But you have to keep calculating because black's king is also in a lot of danger. But if you look carefully after rook f1, you should notice that no matter which check white gives, rook g8, even queen g8, which looks kind of scary, the black king can just run up to h6. This is a beautiful escape square where the king is nicely sheltered by the pawns and white runs out of meaningful checks. So we check, we move in, we go king h6, Queen c1 check, we're defending that square twice, and there we go. We can take, we can take, and we're up a rook. <clears throat> okay, so next puzzle, we have kind of a French-type structure. And, okay, I think this is just a matter of capturing a bunch of hanging pieces. You get a, a certain subset of exercises, uh, and a lot of people, they trick themselves. They, they start looking for something that's not there, and in reality, the solution is just to, like, take everything that you're offered. Just looking at this for a moment, you'll notice that the d4 pawn is hanging. Um, it's attacked twice, it's defended once, and by capturing it, we're forcing the bishop back, and then the b2 pawn falls, and then the knight on a3 is also going to fall because it can't drop back to b1, uh, because the rook on a1 is going to be trapped. Some of you might be tempted by the move c4, but that's just an empty threat. The bishop drops back, there's no clear follow-up because the knight is, at that point, protected by, by the b pawn. Um, more advanced players, uh, you should kind of have this instinct of playing bishop takes d4. Because oftentimes, after queen takes d4, there's going to be a discover check uh, that, that wins black's queen. But here you have to understand that that knight on d7 is blocking off a potential check on this diagonal. That is why this works. Queen takes b2. Okay, knight b5, and you can just capture the knight. Cool. Okay. So here we have an exercise in which first thing I see is that the queens are facing each other. So taking the knight is out of the question. First thing that we should consider is, again, checks, captures, and threats. I follow the rules, right? Now, you don't want to follow the rules dogmatically. Um, you want to start by assessing the position, kind of guiding 
you're thinking in the right direction. But ultimately, the rule of checks, captures, and threats, it exists for a reason because, yeah, most introductory moves are in fact, do in fact belong uh, to one of those categories. So queen takes queen, what happens? Well, if white takes with a rook, then we can uh, take the knight on, on c4. And if white takes with the knight, then you should understand that when you have a situation with pieces that are so cramped, um, oftentimes you can attack kind of the base and the whole position collapses. So the rook is, is the base. It's guarding the knight on d2. We can slide our bishop up to c2 and white loses uh, at the very least an exchange. Right? So knight takes d2, bishop would have slid up to c2. And uh, if the rook moved away, then we would have just captured the knight. Okay, this is easy. We take and we're up a piece. On we go, puzzle number 28. Well, here I see that we're down a queen and probably some other things, which tells me that this has to be checkmate. Right? There's no way that we're winning this game in any other way other than checkmate or maybe, I don't know, um, getting our opponent to uh, leave the board and lose on time. <laughs> but there is a pretty common checkmating pattern here. This knight on f5 is the first component and the doubled rooks are the second component. We use the doubled rooks to crash through down the h file, rook h5, rook h5, and we use the knight on f5 as not only a restrictive piece, but also a supporting piece, because rook h6 is only checkmate thanks to the knight on f5, and also the knight on f3, which is guarding the g5 square. So checkmates that involve like a rook and two knights are not that uncommon, particularly on the king side, particularly when you have a knight uh, or as Ben Feingold would say, a knife on f5. Okay, number 28, we're almost halfway through, but obviously uh, puzzles are going to start getting tougher. Now here we have a situation in which white has a rook for two minor pieces. Uh, I'm noticing that there is this slightly bothersome x-ray, but it's not actually bothersome at all when you stop to think about it because the rook on a8 is unprotected, so black is not threatening to move the bishop anywhere. There's no checks, which gives us the ability to do whatever we want to do in the center. What's going on in the center? Well, there's a, a pin against the bishop. The bishop on d4 is uh, a type 2 undefended piece, uh, which is terminology I've introduced before. Uh, type 1 undefended piece is a piece that's not protected by anything. Type 2 undefended piece is a piece that's only protected by one other piece. And the point of this characterization is that you should essentially you should essentially categorize type 2 undefended pieces in the same way that you think of type 1 undefended pieces. A piece that's defended by just one other piece is like a tooth, you know, that's like held by one very loose tendon. And so the bishop on d4 is what I'm focused on. Can we attack that bishop? Well, not really, right? We can't play queen e4. Queen e3 is a cool move, but it just leads to a trade of queens and the bishop can evacuate. But we can also intercept, right? I'm looking at the pawn on c4. I'm seeing the bishop on f3. That bishop can slide up to d5, creating a double attack. This is all this is is a double attack um, because we're hitting the bishop and we're hitting the pawn on f7. Black tries to defend against both threats. Now, this is a smart move because if we just blindly take the knight, black will take back with the pawn and we're at a dead end. So instead, you have to start by taking the bishop. And you should notice that if knight takes d4 happens, we take on f7. Again, the queen bishop battery plays a crucial role. King h8 and queen g8 is going to be mate. Cool beans. All right. So once again, looking at this for just a couple of seconds, my brain is just screaming. It's got to be some checkmate. Now, especially in light of the fact that this bishop on d5, it restricts the king's escape square. So when you have situations in which you're trying to deliver mate, particularly in the center of the board, you should always pay attention to uh, the potential evacuation routes that the enemy king has and whether they are covered by some of your pieces. Here, it's, a, it's an ideal arrangement because black's pieces are blocking the king's backward escape routes, whereas our bishop on d5 is blocking the king from escaping via c6, which means uh, that we can safely look for uh, mating patterns, kind of broadly speaking, on the king's side, the e file through to the h file. And, such a mating pattern exists. We deliver the check on f5, and then queen f7 would have been mate on the next move. Okay, so here, another important pattern, another basic pattern. The bishop on c4 is pinning the pawn on f7. This is a very common blunder at really at all levels. Even GMs blunder this type of motif um, constantly, maybe not in such a rudimentary form, 
But nonetheless, right, the pawn on f7 is immobile. Imagine that it didn't exist, that there was a zebra on f7, that there was, you know, I don't know, LeBron James is sitting on f7. LeBron James isn't known for his ability to defend the g6 pawn. So here the correct move is queen takes g6 with mate to follow. Queen f7 is mate. Okay, this is another forced mate. I think you're starting to get the hang of it. We're on puzzle number 32. We're still in the general realm of fairly basic checkmates. This is a mate in three. We start with queen f7, and now uh, we use the knight. We jump into e6, and then we deliver that back rank mate on e8. Check and checkmate. All right, this is... Okay, what's happening here? Well, I'm immediately noticing the queen and the knight, the best tandem in all of chess. It's like the Hikaru Levy of chess pieces. Um, it's an amazing team. And the first thing that you should consider is this check on h7. Now, the king is able to evacuate. King f8, queen h8, king e7, queen takes g7, king to d6. And once you get into these more advanced puzzles, you should remember that oftentimes the goal and the process is to hunt the king until it reaches a certain point, and not necessarily to then checkmate the king, but to use the vulnerability of the king and cash in your chips and win material. Um, this is a perfect example of that. At the end of the line, hopefully you're able to spot that there's a fork on f7, knight f7. We pick up black's queen, and just a quick glance at the initial material, we are actually down a minor, minor piece. So at best, black is going to have two minor pieces for the queen, as well as a terrible king. Let's go for it. Check, check check and the key move the fork on f7 take the queen win the game okay let's move forward now we have a position a crazy position black is down a piece okay so we're down a minor piece but i'm noticing that the white king on g1 of course is is dreadfully weak because white's entire queen side is frozen so uh, there's this check on d1 that we should start with because maybe we can find a force mate rook d1 check king f2 now, it would be very nice to play queen d2 check, but we can't do that. The knight's guarding that square. Do we have any other checks there? Well, we can take the rook on f3, but let's pause for a second. We have a better move. Rook d1, king f2. Look at the whole board. Queen to h4, diagonal check. That's forced mate because king e2, queen e1 is mate. And if white blocks with a pawn, this is a very common scenario. Pawn moves forward and kind of opens up the possibility for a lateral checkmate. All right, so this is just a matter, again, of following the rules. There's no magic to solving these types of mating exercises. You just have to go through the motions, uh, consider all of the possible checks. And my big advice is, again, not to go down too deep into the rabbit hole, um, at least until you hit, you know, puzzle 50. Um, these puzzles are still pretty basic. So if you're seven, eight moves into a variation, that probably means long variation, wrong variation. Uh, that, that cliche applies. So I would really emphasize breadth per search rather than depth per search, particularly when it comes to these uh, easier puzzles, because it's much more important to identify like the initial correct candidate move rather than spend too much time going down, you know, potential uh, potential red herring. Queen H4 is mate. Okay, so here we have yet another basic mating pattern. Uh, we've got the queen and the rook on F7. This is another battery immediately you should spot the possibility of a mate on f1. What's stopping us? Well, that knight on f4 is stopping us. Can we move it away with check? We can. Now we can play knight e2 check and knight h3 check. Comparison, very important. Knight e2 allows queen takes e2 and the white queen guards that f1 square. So we, we check on h3. Now when you have these situations, when you're moving a piece away with check, right, or you're moving a piece away with tempo, you have to make sure that when your opponent captures that piece uh, that they don't simultaneously guard the mating square or that they don't capture that piece with checkmate uh, or with check or that they don't capture that piece and simultaneously create a escape square for the king for instance and none of that applies here queen f1 is mate awesome okay so we are actually in check here and uh these puzzles are usually very tough the ones where you have to decide between several different escapes now we have to decide between king g4 and king h4. Those are the only two legal moves. And presumably white is playing for a win. And the reason I say that white is playing for a win, even though we are a full rook down, is because I'm very familiar with this type of situation where 
the enemy king is kind of sandwiched on the side of the board. Furthermore, we have this monster passer on e6, which can advance up to e7, and that will set up even more mating patterns, such as the possibility of a queen f8 check. So the goal here should be to eliminate checks. We should put the king on the safest possible square. Well, which is the safest square? Well, clearly, it's h4, because king to g4 allows black to deliver a check on e2, and it seems like in that situation, black has at least a draw. So king h4, queen e2. Now let's be very, very careful uh, because black is threatening mate on h5. Okay. Um, black is threatening mate on h5. If we play, play g4, then uh, we get we get mated on h2. So these types of situations are very, very tricky. We have to find some sort of defense here. Now it's taking me a second to spot it. Also, I, I should point out that in many of these not many of these, but you'll get a couple of exercises where you actually have to draw the game. The, the objective is not to win. And I actually really like that because this mimics actual real game scenarios where you never know. Are you winning? Are you drawn? Sometimes you have to adjust your expectations. And I think this is a, an example of just such a position where um, I thought that white was playing for one initially, but now I notice that black has too many mate threats and we have to force the draw. And we can force the draw by delivering a perpetual check. Queen g5, queen e7. And we've got nothing better than to return to g5. Again, because black is threatening this mate on h5 and potentially the mate on h2 as well. We make the draw. Okay. So another clear example of hunting down the king. I can tell you that even without calculating a single move because I see that white is up a rook and a minor piece. That's an overwhelming material advantage. So we have to try to use our remaining pieces to hunt down the white king. Let's start looking for checks. Well, there's knight to e4 check. There's also queen to d5 check, and that seems very promising. Queen d5 check. If king to e1, we've got the mate on d1. Um, again, I'm drawing your attention here to the role of the bishop as a, an auxiliary piece, um, protecting the knight on f2. If, after queen d5, white... Moves forward to c3. We have our choice of checkmates. Knight to d1 or knight e4 uh, are both mate. Let's go for it. Yeah, knight d4 is the most resilient move, but it doesn't actually change anything. We just play queen takes d4, and queen d1 is still checkmate. Okay, so another puzzle in which we are in check. Um, and most of the time, when you're in check, um, particularly if both kings are weak, uh, this is process of elimination. The best way to solve these types of exercises is process of elimination. Um, oftentimes, all of the moves except one are going to step into some form of like nefarious check or some mating pattern. This is easy because stepping onto the e-file is madness, right? You're allowing, not Magnus. Magnus definitely wouldn't do that. It's madness for many reasons, but one of which is that why are we walking the king on a suicide mission, allowing the check on e8? So clearly we have to go king to d1. And now we have another decision to make. Can we take this rook? Well, why not? King takes c1. Black has a bunch of checks, but all of them are meaningless. If black pushes the pawn, we just go back to d1. If black plays queen to c5, right, and this might scare some of you because the black queen seems to be coming into c2, but remember, you can use your pieces to block checks. King c1, queen c5, we can play queen c4. And if king takes c1, rook c8, eh, we can even go king to b1. So here, actually, king to b2 gets mated. King to b2 gets mated uh, in a very similar way to the previous exercise. Queen c2, king a3, and queen c1 is mate. Notice the role that is played by the pawn on a5, guarding the b4 square. So queen c4 is an only move. Boom. We're almost at 40. Uh, making good progress. Um, I'm aiming for like an hour, hour 15 as, as, a, as a video length here. So I think we're doing pretty well. This is a version of Anastasia's mate. Now, the classic Anastasia's mate is where you have that knight on e7 and uh, a rook or a queen delivering mate on the h file. You can look it up if you're not familiar with it. This is a version where the bishop is the piece that holds down uh, the escape square. So if you're familiar with the pattern, then this sequence should come very easily. If you're not, um, it might be confusing because you probably notice the fact that um, you have the prospect of a discovered check. You have the bishop on b3. The knight can move away and deliver a discovered check. So some people might think, oh, well, let's go knight takes c7 check and let's help ourselves to a rook. 
Well, that's wrong on several fronts. First of all, our queen is hanging. Second of all, if we don't deliver a double check, black is going to snap the bishop off the board. And uh, it's very important when you have a discover check situation to assess whether your opponent is attacking the tail of the discovery, right? The tail of the discovery, the piece that's actually giving the check, not the piece that's moving away. If that piece is under attack, it means that the best way to exploit the discovery is to deliver a double check. That's the only way to ensure that the king has to move. Okay, enough talking. The mating pattern here is 97. And now we need to open up the H file. We do that by sacking the knight and delivering the mate on H3. Boom. All right. Number 40. Well, obviously we have this fork on E5. But once we hit puzzle number 40, we have officially made our way into semi-advanced intermediate to advanced puzzle territory, which means you're not really going to get, with some very rare exceptions, a puzzle where you're just like taking a free piece. You have to force yourself to keep calculating. There's generally going to be more than meets the eye. And this is a perfect example. 95 check. White's going to move up to C7. And after knight takes F3, white's going to go D6 check. And actually, if you've watched my recent pawn versus knight endgame video, uh, that should help you have a good roadmap in this position. After d6 check, we have to slide our king away. For example, king f7. And white plays d7. And at first, it looks like we have no way to stop uh, white's pawn from promoting. And strictly speaking, that is true. Knight e5, king c7, knight f3, d6 check, king f7, d7. But one of the most important concepts is using the knight fork as a way of indirectly taking the sting out of promotion. So in that position, we have this move knight to d4. Knight to d4, and after white promotes, we have the fork on e6. So if you've had a hard time visualizing that, this is where you can start making moves on the board uh, if, if you're having a hard time following along. But we can go for the line, knight e5, knight f3. So the key here is, number one, not to stop calculating after knight takes f3, and number two, um, to understand that even if promotion is inevitable, you can still use this very nifty tactic, knight to d4. White actually could have made a knight there, just a quick note, uh, if you spotted this, major kudos to you. Um, white can make a knight and probably should make a knight, but it's not going to change anything because the knight is dominated and we have this massive passer on f4. This pass pawn is completely unstoppable. So just pointing that out. All right. Keep going. We're at 40. We've got 20 more to go. Okay, well, this is actually made in two or made in three. I'm not sure what it's doing at this at this level. I guess what they're trying to do is mislead you into thinking that the correct move is bishop a3. But uh, this is a perfect example of uh, reasoning via escape routes, right? So if you understand that the most important thing in a king hunt in a, in a mating pattern is to limit the escape routes, then the move should come pretty natural to you because the only escape route is via d2. If you can cover that square, then queen a1 is going to be mate. So you might say, oh, well, then it's bishop b4, but that's not a check, and our own king is in harm's way. So bishop h6, bishop f4, and queen a1 is made. Whoa. Okay, very weird position. Let's take a moment here. Boo. No more t. Oh, a little bit. A little bit more. All right. So first of all, let's count the material um, before we do anything else. Black has two rooks. We have one rook. We have three minor pieces. Black has two minor pieces. So we're technically down in exchange. Um, so it, it, the materialistic approach would be to, to take the bishop on e1. But I'm looking at white's king on f3, and I'm intuitively ruling that out. There, there's no way black can take on d5. I mean, come on. The king on f3 is just going to get surrounded. So that tells me we should look for checks. We should look for something more forcing. Do we have any checks? Oh, we do. Right, we have bishop takes d7 check. And it's easy to kind of laugh at that move. But again, remember type 2 undefended pieces. The rook on f8, it's only defended by the other rook on d8. And the queen is making contact with it. So bishop takes d7 is in fact just a simple deflection tactic. If black takes with a the rook, then we're, we take the rook on f8 with check. We're chilling. If black sidesteps with king to b8, then the bishop moves up to f4 with a fork uh, against the queen and the king. If the king takes, to, takes d7 then the king is going to be very exposed. And that's probably going to be the main line. Yes. Here, you have to remember that check can be a retreating move. Right? Retreating moves are a blind spot for the vast majority of 
the vast majority of the chess playing population has a hard time looking for retreating moves. That's just inherent. It, it, and it doesn't matter. You're a GM, you're a beginner. It's hard to find moves where you move a piece backward. But remember that when you're looking for a mating pattern or you're looking for a way to continue the attack, um, you should constantly remind yourself, did I look for retreating moves? Did I look for retreating checks? Perfect example, queen to g4. Super powerful move. King e7 would run into queen e6 mate. And as soon as the king gets to this diagonal, we already know that bishop f4 picks up the queen. We recapture with the queen so that it's a check and we win the game. Okay, now this puzzle, uh, again, another red herring puzzle, as I would call it, where the difficulty lies not in the solution itself, but in the fact that you might be misled by the presence of some other tempting phenomenon. In this case, the pawn on a6 has nothing to do with this puzzle at all, and they're trying to lead you to believe that it does. Right? They're trying to lead you to believe that a7 is, is the right move, but pay attention to Black's King for a second. What are its escape routes? Only two, right? e3 and g3, because the fifth rank is covered, we have the perfect piece to cover that. We step into opposition, and just really quickly, why does the puzzle end here? Because we're threatening two checkmates. We're threatening g3, and we're threatening rook f5. Black has no way to stop both of them. We win. On we go. Okay, an endgame. An endgame in which the knights are fighting, uh, in which the pawns are fighting against the knight. Very on theme. Now, my question is, why can't we just push g4? What's the catch here? Well, let's try to calculate g4. If the knight moves to h4, then we just push h2 and we promote the pawn. If g4, knight h2, again, looks like we just go g3, we promote. My guess is that after g4, white is relying on the move king to e4. But we can start by, by playing it. And when you have knight versus pawn endgames, as I mentioned in my video... Um, you need to remember that the side that has the knight can use that knight as a bargaining chip. It can sacrifice that knight back, and the resulting pawn end game isn't guaranteed to be a win. Sometimes it's even losing. This is a great example of that. If you just blindly take the knight, white recaptures of the king, and the king is stopping both of black's pawns. So the correct approach here is just to ignore the knight, right? What's the fastest way of promoting here? Forget that the knight is there. Well, then the move is easy. We just go g3, and then we go h2. And the pawn is unstoppable. Lovely exercise. All right. Well, this one is very, very clearly a uh, a search for checkmate because white has a ton of pieces surrounding our own king. White is threatening mate in one. So that tells me it's probably going to be a series of checks. Brute force approach is by far the best approach to take here. Um, so there's two checks here that seem to make sense. It's queen h1 and queen f1. Now, if you want to really optimize your thinking, um, generally the move with the highest chances of success is the one that forces the king to the side of the board, that forces the king to the area of the board where the king has least mobility. Obviously, then it's easiest to set up a checkmate. Now, that's absolutely not a dogma. That's not always true. But if you're playing a bullet game and you only have time to calculate one variation, you want to take queen h1 check because it forces the king to the side, king h3. Then we play queen f1 check, forcing the knight to drop back, and we have this rook on g5 that can then deliver sort of a, a weird form of the ladder checkmate with rook h5. Okay, whereas if we started with queen f1, the king would escape to f3, and if we tried to do the same thing, the knight would block on g2, and the king on f3 would actually have been totally safe. So check, checkmate. All right. So here we have a situation where a lot of pieces are making contact with each other, which immediately tells me this is probably going to be some sort of a move order exercise where you have to kind of get the order of operations right. Um, essentially, we're deciding between taking white's queen or probably taking the knight on e4. And upon closer examination, you should see that if you play queen takes d1, white's going to start by taking the knight on f6 with a check and then recapture on d1. We haven't achieved anything. Right, so especially when the king is in the center, you have to be very aware of these uh, intermediate captures. Not just intermediate moves, but also intermediate recaptures. So what happens if we start with knight takes knight? Well, clearly white can't take with a rook. That drops the queen. So knight takes e4, queen takes queen. I assume we take with a rook. White takes the knight with a rook. And there we have... What do we have there? We have this check on d1. 
And that looks like a super promising check because if in that position, bl white blocks with the rook, right? So takes, 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 logical. Rook to d1 check. If white blocks with the rook, here a great uh, way to practice your visualization. Do you see the winning move? The winning move is bishop takes knight, which simultaneously removes the defender and also protects the rook on d1. Let's go for it. Now, obviously, white can block with a knight here, and I didn't really calculate this move because knight e1, it's clear that black is dominating here. Material is equal, and if white has to settle for knight e1, well, the bishop on c1 is paralyzed. The rook on e4 is unstable. Probably black has a forced win there. So I didn't really take knight e1 too seriously. The, the critical line, it was this one. Takes, takes, and we're up a piece at the end. Okay, now this one's just mate in two. Um, again, it's all about understanding escape routes. You might say, wait, queen d3, is that mate? Nope, there's a pawn on c2. We can't deflect that pawn. If you give queen c5 check, you're allowing the king to step back to safety. So you need to remember that pawns can be full-fledged attackers. A pawn is essentially a piece. All right, so the mate here is f4, king takes e4, and queen d5. Pretty easy exercise. We're approaching 50, ladies and gentlemen. We're approaching an hour of video time. Let's keep it moving swiftly. Okay, so we're down a rook here, but very clearly white's king is caught in some sort of crossfire with our three pieces all very nicely primed to start the attack. Um, again, you always need to be aware of the safety of your own king. I repeat this line constantly to students, um, and it's just something that has to be second nature. Right, so one thing I notice is that with the king on h8, there's no bishop on g7. So a move that we can rule out immediately is knight to d4 because white steps forward to f6, check, and picks up the knight. Um, now, because we're down a rook, I'm also very cold on queen takes c2, check. King takes c2, knight d4, check. King c3, we take the queen. At the end, we liquidate into a rook endgame, but clearly we're not better. That is why it's so important to count the material at the start of these more advanced exercises, as primitive as it sounds, it kind of is a good compass because if material was equal, queen takes e2 is fantastic. But because we're down a rook, we need to look for something more convincing. So are there any other candidate moves? Well, there's queen b1 check, but white can just block with a rook. But that rook on c2 is pinned, and we have a second way of attacking it, and I think rook to c8 is the key to the kingdom here because... We're, well, we're threatening to play rook takes c2, and that's crushing. And if white defends with the queen, then... Okay, white plays knight c7, we obviously take. Just really quickly, if white had defended with the queen, then we would have played rook takes rook, queen takes uh, rook, and knight e3 uh, with a fork. So this was all about just patiently sorting through the candidate moves and not forgetting to check for the safety of your own king. All right, so this puzzle is one that you should be very familiar with. Not this exact puzzle, but this theme. If you do a uh, regular puzzle rush, then you should know that one of the favorite chess.com favorite exercises involves a fork uh, on a5 or h5 or h4, as it were. Um, very commonly missed by players, again, of all levels. Um, I, I want to say that... Let me see if I can find this game really quickly. Uh, there was a famous game long time ago, early 20th century, Akiba Rubinstein one of the top players of the 20th century, one of the first sort of truly positional grandmasters, he blundered a tactic like this. Yes, he did. Let me see if I can pull up that game. Maybe I'm... Yeah, I think I found it. No? It's funny. I. <laughs> oh, it's his opponent. I'm sorry. It's his opponent who blundered it. Um, so my memory wasn't entirely wrong. I'm getting a little bit old. Go back to the chess space scene. A moment here. There it is. Okay, now this is not, in fact, my game anymore. <laughs> uh, let's change that to Mr. Rubenstein, 1922, and his opponent in this position, right? Just to show you that, yeah, even top players, they are very much capable of blundering stuff like this. Black goes d6. Normal conventional move, and immediately you notice the bishop, you notice the king, boom, shakalaka. Black actually goes knight c6, but d5 is a very common situation. Now, the knight is lost, and black resigned shortly thereafter. So, uh, very important to keep track of this tactic. Oop, wrong scene. There we go. 
So here, the important thing is just not to disturb the mechanism, which means knight to d7 gives white an emergency option to take on d7. So we go king f8, we check, we take, and we win the piece. All right. This one seems like another very easy exercise. Um, okay, the rook has just captured something on, on f7. So I'm noticing two things. I'm noticing, first of all, that we have two different ways to recapture, but I'm also seeing that there is the x-ray the standoff between the rooks. The rook on d8 is a type 2 undefended piece, which means if we if we deflect the queen, then we should ultimately be able to pick up that rook. That immediately gives you the right move. We don't even really have to think about bishop f7. The correct move is queen f7, bishop f7, rook takes d8 with an extra exchange. And so we've done 50 puzzles, folks. Um, but unlike the last video, we are going to try to go for 10 more. These are, of course, the 10 toughest ones. So for the more advanced players watching, Maybe you fast forwarded to this point, uh, but hopefully you've been enjoying uh, the video thus far. Um, hopefully I'm not going too fast, but now it's time to slow down a little bit and try to go flawlessly all the way up to 60. Okay, so we're down a piece here, right? We're down a bishop, but there is a king on g5 and kings on g5 like this can potentially be checkmated. So let's consider some candidate moves. Let's say that we give a check on e5. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Queen e5 check. Again, because I'm aware of the escape routes. I don't want to do queen g3 because it allows the king to go back. Queen e5 check. Black has a couple of options. There's king h6. And king h6 is a problem, isn't it? Right? Because queen e5, king h6, queen f4, queen g5. Now, maybe we have perpetual check there. I haven't yet determined if we're playing for a draw or a win. We need to look at more candidate moves to determine that. So let's continue looking at checks. Well, we can use our pawns. We can play f4 check, but then, okay, at the very least, black can play king h6 again. And f4 is an illogical move because it blocks off the, the access that the white queen otherwise would have to these squares. What about the other side, h4 check? Now, wait a second. Now, this is a little bit more promising, ladies and gentlemen, because if black plays king h6, then we can step back with the queen and deliver the check on f4. Black has to go forward to h5. And in that position, oh, it's a beautiful mate. It's a beautiful mate. See if you can spot it. h4, king h6, queen f4, king h5. We advance our pawn to g4. Now you might say, well, that's mate. It's not, because by pushing your pawn, you're interfering with the lateral connection. I made this point before in a slightly different way. Black can play king takes h4. So let's do this again. Check, back, check forward, check, takes, that pawn goes up to g5, once again opening up the connection between the queen and the king, and once the king steps back to h5, the queen slides over to g4 with a beautiful checkmating pattern. Remember that pinned pieces protect, PPP, that's a good abbreviation to remember for newer players. Now, in that final position, you might notice that the black bishop is actually pinning the f pawn but that doesn't mean king takes g4 is a legal move. You cannot put the king on pre. That is a golden rule. But we're not done calculating. After h4, we need to consider the other options. Now there's king f5, but then we have g4 check. Black plays queen takes g4, and f takes g4 is illegal. But there I see that we have the alignment of the queen and the king, so we can slide our queen up to d7 and pick up black's queen, winning the queen. So after h4... King takes h4 is essentially a version of the other line. It actually accelerates the defeat. Queen f4, checking h5, g4, g5, and then queen g4. I think we can go for it. Yeah, so this is the main line. Now we drop the queen back to f4. We push the pawn up to g4. And the, the crux of this exercise, other than just kind of brute force uh, considering Canada moves, is to understand this mating pattern. If the king steps up to h4, that pawn advances all the way up to g5, and then the queen slides into g4. Why is this necessary? Because it essentially immobilizes black's queen, and, and also the pawn on g5 covers the h6 square, so that's the logic. Okay, queen g4, queen g4, and we win. All right, so 52. We are down a rook, a full rook. Okay, that's not good, which tells me that we have to go for the jugular here, that there's no alternative. So in a lot of these cases, you can make the first move without calculating the rest of the line. Again, you don't need to be a dogmatic about fours. Now, I must calculate the whole line. My philosophy is always, 
you know, pretend that you're in a real game. Do what you would do in a real game. Practice real game habits. And in a real game, if you had this position, well, white's got only one logical move. You have to try rook takes g7. Here again, king h5 is forced. And the real exercise probably is to figure out the correct move here. Because black has covered the h7 square, so we don't have a checkmate. And we need to find some way to coordinate our pieces in order to create unstoppable threats against Black's king. So the obvious move here is king takes h6. Uh, this is Sparta. Let's involve the king. But king takes h6 exposes the king to some very nasty checks. Queen f4 check. Eh. If we play g5, then we allow queen h4 check and then queen e4 check. That looks like a dead end. Now, it's very important not to get fixated on one particular type of pattern. Right? When you get to these more advanced exercises, what they often get you on is they get you to really fixate and they get you to say, well, if we're going to mate Black's king, it, it has to be with a move rook h7. That's not necessarily true, right? And the moment you divorce yourself from that idea, you should spot the correct move, I think, which is rook back to g6, which creates a million threats. Queen g7 mate, rook takes h6, and most importantly, it keeps the king completely safe. Rook g6, a queen takes g6, king g6, rook g8, and now simply king takes h6, and uh, mate is unstoppable. Lovely. On we go. 53. Let's keep soldiering on. Another heavy piece endgame. And first question, why can't we take on f2? Can we take on f2? So, okay. Now, rook takes f2 exposes the back rank, but if black plays queen c1, we can cover with the rook. If black plays rook b1, we could just go king h2. I don't see the problem with that. Okay. So what's the catch? What is black's idea after rook takes f2? Ah, well, I noticed that the rook on e6 is an LPDO, uh, is an undefended piece. So rook f2, black can actually just recapture on f2. And if we play king takes f2, black picks up the rook with queen f5, leading to an unconvincing queen endgame. So let's pause for a second. Rook takes f2, rook takes f2. Do we have any intermediate moves that maybe bring the rook onto a defended square. Oh, well, we have queen c8 check and rook e8 check, but both of those moves have the same problem. Actually, exactly the same problem that queen c1 check has. The rook can just return, right? So rook f2, rook f2, rook e8. Black's rook can block uh, on f8, and we're at a dead end. But move order is an incredibly powerful device. We don't have to start with rook takes f2, okay? We can start by trying to secure the rook on e6, and only then we can try to capture this rook on f2. But how do we do that? Well, there's two ways to do that. We can give the check on c8 first and then play rook takes f2, or we could play rook e8 check and rook takes f2. Let's try to compare. Clearly, one of these falls into some sort of a pitfall. So my intuition is to play rook e8 check because I want the white queen to have potential access to some of these defensive squares. But that doesn't tell us anything. We have to be concrete. Let's start with the with queen c8 check, queen c8 check, king h7, rook takes f2, and let's try to refute, refute that move. Okay, I think I understand what's wrong with it. What's wrong with it is black can deliver the check on c1 there, right? We block with rook f1, and this is precisely what I was saying. Notice that the queen on c8 is actually a terrible piece, and the king on h7 is completely safe. So black can just play queen c2, I think. So once again, queen c8, king h7, Rook f2, check, rook back, queen c2. And I don't see a way for white to defend uh, the g2 pawn. So that is the reason why I think, we, yeah, we have to go rook e8, rook f2. Same variation, but there at the end of the line, there at the end of the line, queen c2, we could drop back to g3. All right. so notice that I used my intuition to kind of postulate what I think is the right move. And then I kind of translated that into concrete calculation. It's not enough just to have a gut feeling, especially in these advanced puzzles, you need to actually calculate. Okay, so this is a weird one. We're down a queen. What, what does this tell us? Well, this tells us that we basically have to go for either mate or there must be some force sequence here that wins the material back. The move again is forced. The first move, the second move is forced. Bishop f4 makes no sense. Yeah, we're threatening checkmate, but white can stop that in a million different ways. Queen c2, queen c3 check. We have to give the check first. But here, let's pause, right? Because another way that they often get you is they make you think that a move is forced, but it's not necessarily forced. I'm also attracted to bishop to d4. 
That threatens a very important mating pattern with bishop g1, bishop f2, and bishop g3. No, it doesn't work. Bishop d4, white can just push the g-pawn, and the king has ample space. We have to take. Okay. Now, once again, it seems to me that the move is forced. Bishop takes g3 doesn't make sense. King g2 and the king escapes. So the only kind of intuitively sensible move is to play h takes g3 and maybe try to promote that pawn. Do we have anything else? Well, we have rook d2 check, but again, white can play king to h1. And okay, we could play h takes g3 there. So I guess it's a showdown between rook d2 check and h takes g3. Rook d2 check, white can also play king to g1. And I don't like where we're heading there because after bishop b3 check, king f1, h takes g3, always be aware of the safety of your own king. This is a mantra. King on g7, in the back of your mind, you have to remember white has this nasty check on c3, which could come in handy, and it comes in handy at the end of that line. So check, king, bishop, king, takes, white has queen c3 check, and black's position collapses. So by process of elimination, we know it's hg. We know it's rook d2. There's no other moves. And we're almost there. I think the goal here is going to be to promote the pawn. So the obvious move is to throw this check in on f2, rook f2 check, king g4, and then simply g2. And I don't see a way for white to stop that pawn. Because at that point, the check on c3 is futile. We just slide our king over to h7. And if white moves the queen back to e1, we can slide the rook up to f1. This is like a very, very classic motif. Unless we're walking into some trap here, I don't see, yeah, simply process of elimination. Boom, boom, boom. Puzzle is solved. 55 or five puzzles away. What's happening here? Okay. Now, this is a double rook endgame. And the first question is can we try to win black's rook directly? Well, the way to do that would be rook e8 check, forcing king to g7, and then rook 1 to e7 check. But black goes king f6. Very important motif where the king attaches itself to one of the rooks. So if you capture your opposing, the enemy rook, the king captures yours. And at the end of the line, there's no skewer. So after rook e8, king to g7, let's pause for a second. Now, that's a very vulnerable situation for black. Do we have any other moves? Well, what I'm really asking is, do we have any other checks? And we do. What if we throw our pawn down the board? Rook e8, king g7, f6. Now, if king takes f6, we just take the rook and win. But if black plays rook takes f6, the point is that we're simply taking the square away from black's king. Then we deliver the check on e7 with the other rook. And now black is busted because the king is unable to attach itself uh, to the rook on e7. And that's it. I think that's the solution. Rook e8 check, f6 check, and rook e7 check, and rook takes h8, and we're winning. Now, let me pause for a second here because I can, I can kind of sense people saying, but wait a second. Again, I don't want to fall into the trap of suggesting that, oh, all of this is easy. How did I spot f6? What? guided me toward considering f6. Why didn't I instead return to the initial position and start looking for a different candidate move here? Well, the, the simple reason is because there's only one check in this position, right? So if there's only one check and there's only one forcing move, well, it makes sense to investigate that forcing move quite deeply. The other very important rule is to try to come back to the last moment at which you had a choice. So let's say that you're calculating a a uh, forced line, long line, short line, calculating a forced line. Okay. Um, it doesn't work. What do you do next? Do, do you go back to the beginning and consider other candidate moves? Well, sometimes, right? And as I said, in the first 20, 30 puzzles, that's probably a sign you're going down the wrong path, barking up the wrong tree. But if you've got a more advanced puzzle, you want to go step by step and make sure that you're not missing uh, any alternatives on move two, on move three, and that's exactly what I did, right? This position, it's easy to take rookie seven for granted, assume it's the only move. The moment you pause and force yourself to look for alternatives, well, at that point, F6, I think is a pretty natural move, right? Throw the pawn up, especially if you understand the significance of the F6 square um, and the necessity uh, of black having control of that square with this king. So anyways, back to puzzle number 56. Okay, um, we're obviously attacking here. We've got these three massive pieces. Can we set up some sort of a mating pattern? So, so, the, so the obvious move here is queen g3 check. White steps back to h1. And 
if I'm playing like a monkey, then I'm going knight to f4 in that position. But that's one option. But that's not really forcing, so let's set that aside and let's look at other candidate moves. If we start with knight f4, we do threaten queen takes h3 mate. But after knight f4, white has queen e3. That's really annoying. And the white queen can slide up to g3 and disrupt our entire mechanism. Not good. Do we have any other candidate moves here? Well, I don't really see any because rook takes g2, just rook takes g2. Queen sack, no, that doesn't work. That's a dead end. Knight f6, maybe? Trying to set up knight takes g4. I also am kind of pessimistic. Knight f6, even a move like queen to d1, just guarding the g-pawn. So let's come back to queen g3 check. King to h1. Now, some of you might, might be like, wait a second, don't we have this beautiful mate queen h3 and knight g3? No, because the rook on g1 will be guarding that square. So let's come back to queen g3, king h1, knight f4. What is our actual threat when we play the move knight f4? Well, our actual threat, I think we have several threats, but I think the big one is actually to play knight takes g2. Um, the point being that then we're threatening queen takes h3 mate. So the question is, does white have a defense to the threat of knight takes g2? White can give the queen up for the rook, but then we've got queen and knight versus two rooks, which is overwhelming. I don't see a move for white. Queen g3, king h1, knight f4. And basically, white's dominated because the rook is paralyzed. It can't move. Knight takes g2, I think, is totally unstoppable. Yeah. So this was just a matter of... See, the, the solution I, I spotted intuitively, but I didn't immediately go down that path. I went back to the start. We considered the other forcing moves. Once we ruled them out, we came back to the correct line and approached it a little bit more deeply and then understood that it was, in fact, uh, the, right, the right sequence. Okay. So now we're in really advanced territory. Um, as you can see, the puzzle rating is, is creeping up to 3,000. We are up a piece in the initial position. It sounds too good to be true. But clearly there are difficulties in converting it because, well, what do I notice? Well, first of all, the bishop on e2 is pinned. And second of all, there's this very nasty pawn on d6, and the white king is very far advanced. So we need to avoid situations where the king moves up to c7, and then white promotes the pawn. So ideally, we would trade the rooks and stop the pawn. So the first move that comes to my mind is actually bishop takes pawn, bishop takes g4, right? I think a lot of you might be tempted by bishop e3 check, but the reason my intuition works the way that it does is because I, I don't actually want the white king to be sent to c7. If, if at all possible to avoid. So let's consider bishop takes pawn. What's nice about this move is that it, it stops d7. So white plays rook takes f2, bishop g4, rook f2, bishop e3 check, king c7, bishop takes f2. Now white can try d7 in that position, but we're winning, beautiful, we're winning. So takes, rook takes, bishop e3, king c7, bishop f2, white plays d7, white is threatening to promote to a queen, and this motif is common across all endgames, where there's a situation the king is supporting a pawn on the seventh rank, and you have minor pieces at your disposal. You throw one of them at the king, forcing the king back and buying yourself a tempo that you can then use to, uh, to immobilize and, and win the pawn. So I'm pretty sure. Oh, and I got it wrong. Oh, man. And like I said, I'll honor my promise. I, um, I didn't consider enough candidate moves. Now, why is bishop g4 wrong? The correct move is, in fact, the correct move is, in fact, bishop e3, and then bishop takes g4. And this is the line that I had calculated, d7, bishop b6 check, right? This is the critical move. And then king takes e7, and the pawn is, the pawn is a goner. Why on earth can't we start with bishop g4? So according to the engine, the reason is rook f2, bishop e3. Oh, and he has king to c6. Oh, my gosh. And bishop d8. <laughs> and apparently this position is drawn, even though we're up a full piece and the pawn on d6 isn't even close to promoting. Why is this a draw? Because, well, there's two reasons. The first is that this f pawn is actually super weak. So we can't go king e8 because we drop both pawns. And we can't really go king e6 because we allow d7. So it's actually a positional draw. Black can't make progress. Black can't make progress. If we try to go after that pawn... Amazing. I mean, white somehow is able to use this pawn as a bargaining chip. And here, bishop f6, wow. Threatening to promote. Bishop e5 and two bishops versus one bishop is a draw. So that's incredible. Um, I 
I crapped on bishop e3 check because I assumed that there was no point in starting with a check and sending the king forward. And the subtlety, this is amazing, is that if here white plays king to c6, right, then we're able to give bishop b5 check. So a lot of these tougher puzzles are not only about spotting, you know, the tactical rudiments, but also then about getting the move order right. And that can be ridiculously, ridiculously convoluted. Um, and intuition can often be inapplicable. So once again, bishop takes g4 essentially cashes in our chips too early and gives white the flexibility of choosing the right square for, for their king. Whereas by starting with a check, we're actually forcing white into the line that I initially indicated. Um, king c7 is forced, and now we can take on g4. And of course, all of this you have to see, and then you have to see the critical move, which is bishop b6 check. My first mistake, I learned a lot from it. No problem. We still have two more strikes. We still have four puzzles to do. Let's keep going. Let's keep pressing on. White to play. Now, this one is a very, very clear example of kingside attack, right? We're attacking really on all sides. G file. I'm also noticing that queen on d2 is x-raying, this h6 pawn. So really, my first my bullet instinct is to play f5 and just set up the threat of queen takes h6, which looks crushing. So for example, f5, e takes f5, queen takes h6, knight to g4, we could just play rook takes g4, f takes g4, and queen h7 is mate. But before we jump into it, let's also consider the sacrifice on g7. Rook g7, king g7, rook g1, king h8, f5 there. But f5 there, the problem is that the, the knight from f6 can, can drop back to g8, guarding the h6 pawn. And if we sack the second rook on g8, the king will capture. And that's unconvincing. So I really don't see any reason we can't go f5 here. And again, this is all about move order. Because now that black goes king h8, here the sack on g7 works. The sack on g7 works. Because king takes g7, rook to g1, and black is not in time to escape. King h7, we have f takes c6 discovery. And king h8, we can take pawn on h6 and win. Bang, bang. Okay, knight g4, rook g4, and we win the game. So let's go through that really, really quickly with an analysis board. Um, f5 was my instinct, and it was my instinct because I spotted the combined forces of the queen and the rook, right? I noticed that if we can get a queen to h6, that's devastating. Um, but I forced myself to calculate the most obvious, or, or the most forcing candidate move, which is the rook sacrifice. And this rook sacrifice, yeah, it doesn't work for a variety of reasons. Even knight h7, as you can see, is a very safe defensive move. And it's a dead end. Right? So there's no reason to commit. We start with f5. We, we win a tempo. And then rook g1 is just crushing. Awesome. Awesome sauce. Ooh, we have a pawn end game. Nice, nice, nice. Number 58 is a pawn end game. Yeah, I kind of recognize this position, but I've seen so many that are similar that it's very, very dangerous to try to kind of remember, oh, this was the right move in that position. You just got to think about it uh, from a clean slate. So this is a pawn race. And in a pawn race, we should start by asking ourselves, well, what happens if we push our damn pawn? So what happens if we play g5? Well, g5, a4, g6, a3. Give me a second here. Okay, so g5, a4, g6, a3 g7 a2 g8 queen a1 queen okay we have simultaneous promotion do we have a skewer in that position no because if we go queen b8 check actually black is an only move king to c5 because a king to c3 would get skewered diagonally actually maybe king a3 is also a draw so just like the blind pushing of the pawn doesn't work um Let's think back to my, my video on pawn races. One of the most important rules is to, to try to use your king uh, to either stop the pawn physically, but or to induce your opponent's king onto a less desirable square. So what that means in this situation is at some point, maybe we should drop the king back to d3. We would be threatening to stop the pawn, and the point would be to force black's king to b3 which would then end up in the checking zone of our g-pawn. If the black king ends up on b3, that's kind of a dream scenario because then we'll, we'll be able to promote with check. So what's the order of operations here? Well, it's definitely not king to d3 because then black can go king c5 
and black is in the square. G5, king, d6, g6, king, e7. Um, so we should probably start with g5. Black plays a4. What if we play king to d3 here? Well, that seems very promising because a3, king, c2, and now we are in the box. And if black plays king b3, then we go g6, a3, g7, a2, and g8 equals queen. I think that's all there is to it. Bang. King to d3. Okay, they went a3, and we just stopped the pawn. And of course, now we need to push g6 and push g7 and stop the pawn and take the queen and promote to our own queen. And that means we're two puzzles away from the promised land. So far, I haven't needed to uh, set up the position on chess base and move pieces. Hopefully, I can keep it that way. Another endgame. Another endgame. This one's a night endgame. And by the looks of, it, looks of it, a very convoluted one. So let's break this down. What's going on here? Well, um, both sides have past pawns. Um, in our case, we have this pawn on g7, which is blockaded by the knight. In black's case, there's this pawn on h3, which is sort of threatening to move to h2. Obviously, we could sack the knight for the pawn, potentially, and that could be a strategy that we that we use. Um, so the question is, how do we maximize the, the strength of our passers? The first move that comes to mind is knight f6, trying to displace black's knight and just promote that g-pawn. Because I'm noticing that after knight f6, knight takes f6, e takes f6, h2, we actually promote with check. The king is in the checking zone of the, the g-pawn. But after knight f6, black is under no obligation to, to trade knights. Black can first of all play h2. Although, wait a second, knight f6, h2, we play knight takes g8, black promotes to a queen, we move the knight back, and because of the awkward placement of this king on g2, black doesn't have any checks. And promotion is inevitable. But I still think that's a draw. Because knight f6, h2, knight takes g8, h1, queen, knight f6, for example, black can play king takes f3, g8, queen, and queen h2 check for king, the king and white's only remaining pawn. And unfortunately, queen and knight versus queen is, uh, in most cases, a dead draw. And I'll show this on the analysis board afterward. So let's put knight f6 aside for now. Let's consider the other candidate moves. What happens if we push f4? Okay, f4. Well, if black just naively plays h2, then I think we're, we're chilling. We sack on h2, we push f5, and the pawns are clearly unstoppable. But after f4, black is going to try to go king to g3, I'm pretty sure, and dislodge the knight and then play h2. So f4, king to g3. First of all, what happens if we just continue to push f5 king takes knight f6 h2 f7 h1 queen f takes g8 queen and we have a queen endgame there which by the looks of it is winning for white because we also have that passer on g7 that still exists so that's a very promising promising outline um do we have any other candidate moves on, on the first move that we need to address? Well, e6 doesn't make any sense to me because black can just play king takes f3. And these are the two pawns which are least effective because they're both blockaded by the knight. The f pawn has to play a role if we want to ultimately overpower this knight. And I don't see a better use of our time than just to push f4. I mean, knight e3 check just gives up the pawn. We already talked about knight f6. I think we have to take the plunge and go for f4. Yes, it's the right move. Now let's pause here because knight f6 here is also a possible move. Is it any better? No, it's definitely worse. If we go knight f6 here, then because the black king has stepped away, the white king is now vulnerable to uh, a check on the second rank. That's out of the question. I think f5 is absolutely forced. f6, and the puzzle is solved. Wow, very deep. H3, I really like this one, actually. So just to repeat my my logic, first uh, intuition was to try to get rid of this knight and to go knight f6. But after h2, knight g8, h1, queen, first of all, notice that I didn't stop calculating here. I noticed that white's king is, is immune to checks. But after king takes f3, g8, queen, LPDO, loose pieces drop off, loose pawns drop off just as easily, queen h2 check, and black is able to pick up e5 with a drop. So really process of elimination brings you to f4. Now h2, knight h2, I think is pretty easy to observe that the pawns are, are overwhelming. King to g3 is the really tricky move because it's so scary 
to give up the knight without even sacrificing it for the H pawn. And this is where concrete calculation takes over. You calculate the pawn race just as you do in a pawn end game. And you make an intuitive judgment. How did I know that this was winning? Well, there's a pawn on g7. It's about to become a queen. And generally, it's very, very hard to deliver a perpetual check when there are obstructions of various kinds on the board. If you try very quickly, what's going to happen is, okay, already here, black is out of check. King a3, boom, queen blocks, and promotion is, is inevitable. But honestly, in many cases, even just like running your king up is ultimately going to escape the checks. Not here, but I kind of intuitively assumed that there was going to be a way for white to get out of the checks. And, you know, there was uh, using the queen dropping back to b3. Very nice. And ladies and gentlemen, our final, hopefully, hopefully our final exercise, if we get it right, uh, to hit 60. We definitely won't be able to go past 60 because this video is already... At 90 minutes, man, does time fly? Okay, white to play and presumably win. So we are down a rook, but the king on e7 is clearly under a lot of stress. The first move that comes to my mind is, is the check on b7. It's really the only meaningful check. And it's helped along by the fact that queen d7, rook c7 looks totally devastating was the queen. But after queen b7 check, black is going to step back, presumably to f8, so king f8, for instance. And what happens if in that position we slide our rook into c7? I mean, that looks, honestly, very, very, very powerful. And that's not even the only move, right? If I think about it carefully, what do I notice after queen b7, king f8? Well, I notice that um, the rook on a8 is a type 2 undefended piece. The queen on d8 is overloaded. So we could also play a move like knight to d6 or even knight to g5. And that looks totally crushing to me. Um, let's start with queen b7. I'm, I would be shocked if it's not the move. Now, it's clearly a matter of choosing the most accurate way to attack the f7 pawn. What I do not like about rook c7, apart from the fact that it's the most obvious move, and this is puzzle number 60, um, and there's typically going to be tricks here, is that it doesn't actually threaten checkmate which is a crazy statement, but it doesn't. If you think about it, rook c7, even if we're allowed to play rook f7, black is going to go king e8. And I don't see mate in that position. Knight d6, queen d6, there, there's just no mate there. So what I like about the knight moves is that they actually threaten mate in one. So let's try to decide between knight g5 and knight to d6. Well, often when you have a situation like this, it's a matter of thinking in terms of squares, right? When you're comparing two different moves, you're comparing... It tactically, yes, but also you're seeing what squares are being controlled and what squares are being let, let free. And if you consider it within that framework, I think you, you, you'll you find that after knight g5, you're allowing black to, to play queen e8 and, and to prolong the defense of f7. And then things get very messy. I think the correct move is knight to d6 here because you're covering the e8 square. If queen takes d6, then you can munch on both rooks and you're just up in exchange there. I think uh, we're home free. Knight d6. Yep. Check. And we takes h8. Gets us to puzzle number 60. Wow. Okay. And that is right 90 minutes on the nose. Okay. So just very quickly, a summary here. Queen b7 check is obvious. I didn't actually do a lot of calculation in this in this puzzle. Um, I, I did kind of mostly intuitive thinking and comparison because rook c7... I recognize that it doesn't really threaten anything. Yeah, bishop a6, check, king e8. And the best that white can do, as you can see, is, is to go rook e7 and, you know, try to wiggle out with a draw. Um, so that narrowed it down to knight d6 and knight to g5. How did I see the concept of knight d6? Well, I, I noticed the concept because I spotted that the rook on a8 is undefended, as is the rook on h8. So the queen could potentially be deflected. Um... And I noticed that the big difference is that knight g5 allows queen e8. As you can see, this is actually still winning for white. So the actual reason that knight g5 is bad is because of queen takes g5, which honestly I didn't consider at all. But now that I look at it, it's 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 obvious what the reason is. You can't take this rook because you can made it on g2 suddenly. So here you have to backpedal a little bit, and you're still better. You can check and then take the bishop, but it's far far from convincing. So I got lucky in that sense. But still, when you use your intuition and you make these smart observations, 
you you tend to get set you, you tend to get rewarded by the chess god so knight d6 there's just no way for black to defend this pawn other than to give up both of the rooks this is completely lost and that's uh that's that ladies and gentlemen okay so we hit 60 um i hope you found the uh the process to be somewhat beneficial helpful um i did open up chess space a couple of times but only to show supporting examples we didn't actually have to make any moves on the board um and hopefully that gave you a chance to practice your visualization as you can see i got one wrong um there were a couple of moments where i was slightly confused but by and large i think 60 is an achievable score uh for for most uh, players who who solve tactics regularly and just to quickly summarize you know the first 20 25 exercises are going to be very rudimentary it's mostly checkmates basic tactics like forks pins that kind of stuff back rank mates that kind of stuff uh with maybe a smattering of just like simple attacking techniques like that bishop takes f7 exercise problems you know 30 to 50 are somewhere in the middle i mean some of them are still going to be like made in two made in three maybe a little bit more complicated but you're going to get a couple of puzzles there that are somewhat more involved for example like this one where we had to spot bishop d5 and then rook takes d4 and then once you get to like 45 50 then you know you enter the territory of truly advanced chess puzzles uh which involve you know creative tactical techniques that might be unconventional or if it's a mating puzzle then you know longer term calculation even though we didn't get that many uh that many like deep calculation exercises in in this particular run uh so i think it's doable I'm a big fan of Puzzle Rush Survival. I think everybody should do it regularly. You should aim to do it a couple of times a week. Um, and uh, I, I just hope that you found this video fun, entertaining. It's a long one. So if you're still here with me, a big pat on the back. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, again, I hope that you find this video beneficial, inspirational, entertaining. And I'm definitely going to keep keep on doing the, the puzzle solving videos um because they seem to be in, in pretty high demand thanks everybody for watching um and uh, hope my first morning video was not an abject failure i'll see you in the next speedrun video as well as the next endgame video it's all being prepared good luck and uh keep on solving goodbye